Uh, I thought I would start and uh, just do everything out of order, but I wanted to thank some people first. First of all, the guys that have been coming here forever, getting up at God knows what time in the morning to get here, and however you get here, um, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, so a lot of people told me that we could never get kids interested in this stuff, and I mean, look, so thank you very much. The guys that are showing up for the first time, uh, I know this can be a little bit intimidating, and it may be that you don't understand anything today. Um, I will try to make sure that you understand everything, but if you don't understand something, please ask me a question. Uh, if I don't have time to explain it, I'll just say it. I'll say it later, and I will. Okay? Um, to the IRT who bears, um, who deals with me a lot, uh, thanks for putting up with me, guys. Um, to Dave, Bill, Morgan, and Tony's not here. Thank you guys for being with me all the time. You guys have no reason to. And uh, to BBA, uh, Tom, and uh, Jenny Daglio, um, who behind the scenes have supported everything that I've done. Um, I just want to give them a shout out. Um, all right, so this is liquidbio.com. If you're new here, this is where you can go to get all the information about the journal club. So you click on this button right here, it'll take you to this page. And uh, this is the talk today. It has the paper down here. Um, for new guys, don't try to read the papers. Just read like the first couple paragraphs. And uh, even if you have trouble with that, don't worry about it. Um, you're not supposed to understand these papers from beginning to end. Only one person is really supposed to be able to do that. And that's me, because I've been working on this for too long. Um, if you want to do something in addition to um, what we have going here in Journal Club, there's a new group called Project 80 um, that started up, and I believe some of you already have invited to that. So uh, you should be hearing more about that coming up. And uh, on to the paper. So I think you'd like to believe that um, the love is in the, our thoughts are somehow greater than what they actually are. I think that it's a common misconception that maybe a misconception, that we actually control our thoughts. Uh, it's possible that we are just chemical reactions that occur. And the thoughts that occur from those are, are almost random, and that we only have, we only have the idea that we control our thoughts. Uh, and that would be enough. But it's a little, little metaphysical right now. Uh, I'll, I'll get on to the paper. All right, so we're going to be talking a lot about circuit here. And what a circuit is, is how you get information into your body and uh, how you put it out, or how you react to it. A very simple one is uh, a pain response. So if I touch my hand to fire, um, I'm not talking about the response that would be a jerk right away, because that's actually the straight there in the back of the hand that bypasses the brain completely. Um, but I'm talking about the you know response that you may give after uh, touching fire. Laugh. That's a bad word. Be a kid. Uh, <laughs> all right. But anyway, um, the nerve, there's a nerve that would travel from your finger to your spinal cord. It would make a connection in there, um, travel off your spinal cord into your brain. It would uh, bounce around in your brain a little bit, and uh, it would connect that feeling to that word. Right? So in the end, you would output somewhere around here. You would come up with that word, and then that would go out to your mouth and, and go to place. Um, this is a pretty simple one. Um, you know, one input, really, like hot, and uh, one output, really. Um, those are oversimplifications here. A much more complicated uh, circuit is something that you might feel with your food or hunger. So uh, if you have a full stomach, your stomach can actually communicate with your brain in two ways. Um, your stomach can communicate directly to your nervous system, but it can also communicate through hormones. And all the fat on your body also can communicate with your brain through hormones saying, I'm fat. Um, and if you have enough of these fat signals, you're supposed to get sleepy um, or content. And you guys have all done this. Like, you know, uh, Thanksgiving dinner, yeah? Eat too much? What happened? Right? Um, so here, we're actually receiving signals from all over the body, fat cells all over the body, you know, in the stomach especially, in the back, in the leg. All these things are communicating with the brain saying, full, fat, no more. 
And, uh, and then you lose that, you basically lose the desire to run after food. And I, I believe you lost food. So the circuit we're going to be talking about is a little bit um, more complicated. I don't, I think lots of things are funny when I do things late at night. So <laughs> I apologize for the Justin Bieber. Um, <laughs> but the idea is simple, right? You have an image of Justin Bieber that hits your eye. Immediately it's translated into basically one beat here and there, off and on, like light things. Um, you can think of it as. Um, that goes straight to the back of your brain. From the back of your brain, that is translated into, this is a line, this is a space. And then it's translated into, those lines form this eye, and a jawline, and a remarkable haircut. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then there's another part of the brain that says, it's Justin Bieber. <laughs> and then you get the warm and fuzzy feeling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, the warm and fuzzy feeling, and then you guys do all the, the giggly, happy, love starring things that you do when you see Justin Bieber. Uh, so there's a couple there's a couple breakdowns of the, the information here. From Justin Bieber to facial recognition, we'll say, was kind of an input process. So that's where the information is coming into your head. Yeah. Can you scroll up the button? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, great. All right, so. That's the input process. What's happening after your eyes and before your mouth is basically processing what your brain is doing with that information. It's shooting it around your brain to different parts. Um, and then you have the output, which is after uh, recognition and what you kind of do and experience with that, right? So I'm going to do this slightly atypically. Generally, I tell my students to tell kids why they should care about something, what the problem is, and then discuss the problem with them. And I'm not going to do um, I'm just going to go straight into it. So, we, I think I, well, I like to certainly, until about two years ago, like to believe that love was something, you know, that transcended life and physical matter, right? It's, it's, it's this powerful force, right? That you feel with somebody else and then there's like butterflies and <laughs> white dogs flying um, and, and stupid behavior. Um, and, uh, so that might look something like you recognize your, oh, it's your bowl now. Okay, so you recognize your mate, um, and then that gets translated into a feeling of high, a feeling of elation. And you guys, I hope you've experienced this, it's kind of cool, I'm getting lots of good looks this morning. But, you know, when you see somebody you love, you feel good. And when you hug them, you feel great. Like, that feels good, you keep returning to that feeling. In a way, it's an addiction. Um, you also, ideally, should feel not cheap. <laughs> um, and those two feelings, that feeling of high and not cheap, should lead you to be faithful. Now that's kind of how I pictured it two years ago. I'm not sure that's how you picture it now, but certainly that's how I picture it. So again, there's a signal, and then this is kind of like, oh, and hug, uh, and then you don't cheat. Um, but there's another alternative. Right? So there's an alternative that there's essentially addiction centers in your brain. Basically, parts of your brain that point you to things, that are concerned with habits, that will lead you to the same thing over and over and over and over again. Whether it be heroin, whether it be love, whether it be food, the same thing over and over again. Any pattern can be seen with any, any like over and over again, as long as you have the input, whatever came to your eye, connecting to that system. Oh, so my question is before about the face recognition. Yeah. I guess it's going to ask where, in, in somebody who has proper pragmatia, uh, where, where the interruption takes place? Um, I believe, and Will, you probably, it's in like D5, which is, I guess, right here. Um, okay. I mean, where on, on that? Oh, where would that be? That would be around here. Because those people can still recognize lines, shapes, trees, other things. Yeah. There's a specific part of your brain actually dedicated to face recognition. And it's actually only dedicated to upright face recognition. If you turn people upside down, you'll find that their your, that your ability to recognize them decreases by a factor. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you actually have a ridiculous um, memory for faces. Like if you see, I think it's 
1,000 pages and you speak to Splash in terms of the second, you have the ability to recall the pedigree of accuracy that you've seen that you don't have So um, that, that facial recognition software that we have is pretty cool. So the other, the other idea is down here. So enkephalin is an opiate. Um, it's a natural opiate. It's an opiate that our bodies produce. But it's certainly also the opiate that uh, heroin hooks into. Catherine, can you stop checking your email? Um, but you recognize your mate. That recognition hooks into your opiate system. Your opiate system makes you feel high. And then you're faithful. So we have these two kind of ideas to think about. Which one is better? Well, if I shut this off, Would this bowl fall in love? Who doesn't understand the answer? I knew you would. Okay, I'm going to do it one more time. Just All right, so A is put in the image of your bowl spouse, um, and Kaplan is produced as opiate in your brain. And that triggers through a nerve the feeling of high. That feeling of high is something you chase because every time you see that guy, you uh, feel high and um, you are faithful. Oh, this is actually specifically talking about heterosexual female or male love. Yeah. Okay, so if you shut this off, cut this out, you should be able to uh, not feel that feeling of high when you recognize your mate, but you also shouldn't be able to get high on heroin. Because that heroin system hooks into the same exact opiate pathway. This is an opiate, this is an opiate. This is a natural opiate produced in a poppy. Poppy? There you go. This <laughs> no, this is, this is a natural opiate produced in your body, okay? Um, so here's the experiment. Uh, we have these, again, these two models to consider, the, the uh, recognition and then the feel high and the not see and then be faithful, or this one where you have the high system connected to the bowl, to the opiate system. So it's not all one thing. So love is just a feeling that you get when you're high on heroin. Uh, not only when you're high. All right, so what, uh, what turns out is this arrow is actually many, many nerves. It's many, many, many nerves in the brain. And there's something called antiacrine, I'll just clap for me, not that one, um, which is an opioid receptor blocker. And um, if you give this to a heroin addict, it's almost dead. Because immediately all their ability to feel the high of heroin gets stopped. And they go into severe withdrawal um, and they can die. Um, but it's also a method they use after a heroin person has become sober. Sober? Sober. Sure. Um, sober to keep that person from feeling the high. It has low rates of spike. It doesn't work that well, and I'm going to explain why later. But if I give that naltrexone, which will stop the heroin from working, and it stops the bull from falling in love, then this bull, or sorry, a bull, when you see this thing, this snake bull, does trigger the opiate system in your brain, an addiction system, and that's what's going to cause you to be faithful. And that's what's inside your house. So this is pretty simple. This is no naltrexone. This is one dose of naltrexone, and this is three doses of naltrexone. So there is the opiate system completely intact here. So the ability to feel high is completely intact here and not present here. And this graph represents partner type. Basically, there's several criteria that determines mathematically whether you're um, preferring one person or one bowl or the other. And you can see here, when the opiate system is intact, there's a high degree. There's a high degree of partner preference, and then the opiate system is cut down. No preference. We do further studies. They're cuddling, um, time between <laughs> standing into the cage and mating and a uh, number of mating bouts, um, you'll see that these are all the same. 
and the bench when a bull is put in a cage with a stranger, he looks with no with the okay to be completely intact. <coughs> with one bow to manifest them, and with three bows to manifest them, you would guarantee that pattern is too small. It keeps coming up. No, this is one of the conditions of partner preference. So puddling is one of the indications. It's also how far you would travel to leave your mate. Um, it's also like if you're new with your mate. So the red arrow is just emphasizing the small bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a graph that shows that if you put in a I'll explain that later. This is mating bounce with one partner. So this is uh, in a cage with just one mate. So this is where they're put in the cage with one mate, they're taken out, and then 24 hours later they're put in a cage with a mate and a kid. Well, the mating bounce is what's keeping the small partner from being Yeah, uh, this is a significant difference. Um, for some reason, this, this bull does not uh, mate as frequently. And we're going to actually talk about that soon. Good question. Um, that's a little bit more to do with genetics. So if you think about like having one ping pong ball and trying to hit 100 bottles with it, um, you'll find that after you reach a certain number, you'll start hitting a large number of the bottles. Um, whereas if you have the difference between one and two balls, Trust me, um, they, you see this pattern in, in biology a lot. It's kind of not linear, but like slow uh, logarithmic scaling kind of pattern. Um, all right, so the second experiment they did um, was slightly more specific. Rather than blocking this entire, all these nerves, um, they blocked a small set of them. And um, so when I say block nerves, Oh. <laughs> All right, now this was the word now. But um, imagine this is encephalin, okay? This is a receptor. Encephalin goes to the receptor, and a feeling shoots up along it, right? It's basically the same idea here. Um, but imagine that, you know, there's several different arms now, each functioning to catch encephalin for each reading position purpose. So what we're looking at here is a really small subset of nerves. A few opioid receptors, and these are really, really hot right now. We're finding uh, lots of addiction in cages and lots of partner preference and lots of particular behavior. Um, and we're not just looking at new, new opioid receptors from more in uh, any part of the brain, but we're looking at them specifically in two addiction centers, or actually two parts of a, a larger addiction center. Um, this addiction center is responsible for sleep. Anger, for fear, for hunger, lust. Um, but we're looking at the specific procedures. We don't really need to know about the procedures. But this is a much more specific blocker. So the question is do you need the entire opiate system in order to shut off the ability to stay with a partner for long? Uh, and the answer is no. So when you shut off, the new opioid the more in the CP, the power of CP, um, you decrease partner preference. So it's these specific, that small subset of neurons to that specific place that is responsible for what I think right now is probably the best measure of love, and that's your ability to stay with someone. Alright, so now if you notice a weird thing happening with that color, this is just the basis. There's like so much more. Um, go ahead. Um, when you look at the other, just to go back, the other uh, receptors that feel like possibly do they look at the bowl to see if it's a different cell pattern there? Yeah, so they did. Um, so you see right here that different, but there's not much of it. Yeah, 
That's from previous literature. Mm -hmm. So they actually thought it was funny to use APIs to punish yourself. Um, that's a response that they were like, this is brilliant, why are we talking about this? Um, that if this happens, this is right next to it. Uh, and it didn't happen. So alcohol addiction that high is different from what happened. Okay. So let's review everything we've done so far. What we've done is connect basically the visual system, the image of the bull. It shoots to the back of the brain, where it's processing the lines and, and basic things. Then that shoots to the top of the brain, which uh, translates it into um, more complicated aspects like faces. And then we go deep into the brain. So this is this is like brain cut in half. So this side here is actually just going straight in um, to about here, um, which is the hypothalamus, which is which is very. So uh, one part of the pathway that I hadn't showed you yet is the beginning part. Um, so in between here and the high, there's another hormone that plays a part called oxytocin. Now this is known. We've already known it for a long time. That oxytocin is going to increase in fact when the temperature is extremely high, which could affect your ability to or want to stay in this position. So um, All right, so um, one thing I wanted to show you from the results of that first study, I showed you this trend before, that when you had no, the opioid system was attacked, um, you had a high level of partner mating, and when you have one dose, you have less, and in three doses, almost no, no preference for partner. So did you guys see the other side of this? Look at the partner preference for a stranger. If, you're, if there's no preference for one over the other, then it should be even. But that's not what happens. If you lose the ability to feel that hot in this study, you go after strangers. So you see this pattern a lot. You see this pattern in addictions a lot. So, um, for example, People used to think it's the high that heroin users and alcoholics chase, but it turns out that's not what it is. So it's after heroin and alcohol use for some temporary period of time, you actually decrease your normal level of, of high, right? So you are depressed. And it's not the high you're seeking, but it's to get out of that depression. Now this drug shut off the entire opioid system. Every opioid receptor was shut off. So that means that your ability that this exists with both to feel no joy related to opioids. Um, and it may be, and this is just my thought here, it may be that they were seeking a different partner because they were hoping that that different partner would cause that joy. Just like When somebody then is recovered from addiction and is put on NCDI to stay off the addiction, mm -hmm. has it been observed in any sort of relationship to all parts? I have not noticed this in, um, <clears throat> I have not seen a study like that. I know that in alcoholics that do recover, the divorce rate after recovery, after about a year of recovery, is much higher um, mm -hmm. than it is in the male. Um, that's a social study, but yeah. Because it would, would seem to follow, then. It would seem to follow, yeah. Um, so I said that oxytocin, uh, we said that oxytocin was uh, involved in labor and uh, it's a little bit creepy. Uh, so things don't just happen in the body, right? You don't just all of a sudden have a kitten, right? Uh, it, 
it comes from somewhere. It evolves from something. Your eyes evolve from something before that. Your fingers, everything evolves from something before that. So I don't want you, I don't want you to say anything out loud. But just tell me, almost, or just in your head, just realize what the feeling that you get when you do this over here. <laughs> right? Like, oh, it's so pretty. Right? <laughs> So, it may be that your love for a guy or girl actually evolved from your love for your child or for kids. Because they both used this pregnancy bump. And they hit them. I thought that was really cool. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, or you're taking a lot of money. <laughs> okay, so here's another question. If I had a quarter, um, if I had a theory that there was a quarter and it had two heads, um, is that possible? Yeah? Yeah. Right, don't pause. Possible, right? Okay, and if I flipped it, and I got heads 50% of the time, and I got something else another 50% of the time, what would you say about my theory? Wrong, right? 50% of the time it's wrong. It doesn't predict what actually happens. This is where I get to the problem. The problem may be that the idea of love and the idea of monogamy that we have for humans isn't the right one. 51 or slightly higher than 50% of uh, marriage is not only true. And I don't know if this is an accurate predictor of love, but I think it would be. 50% of the idea that you stay with one mate for the rest of your life is wrong. Now, when I was flipping the quarter, you quickly said that that was the wrong idea. But I think we're, for some reason, less likely to believe this. It turns out that there's a very, very high rate of divorce, about four years after marriage. Very high. So maybe a better model would be not that we stay with one mate forever, but that we stay with one mate for about four years. And that we're not monogamous. We're period. Meaning <laughs> we only like one person at the top at one time, but we like different people for a long time. And I know when you're going through high school right now, you know that the person you're with or the person you're attracted to is probably going to change at some point. I hope not. Um, although I think it's probably going to happen. But <laughs> uh, there's a couple other interesting things that I wanted to um, talk about. And um, so it turns out that early love, this period before four years, after the period of the first four years, has some really, really weird, strange hormonal elements. So serotonin is about the same level and activated in the same parts of your brain as OCD behavior does. Or somebody with OCD has. Your serotonin levels in the first year of love are similar to that of a person with OCD. Okay? Um, so obsessive care, obsessive worry about spouse, um, you know, habitually doing things over and over, holding hands, whatever. Um, Nerve growth factor is also highly and increased in the first year of love. And this one I found really interesting. In females, and not males, um, in females, the level of testosterone jacks up. Did you know that testosterone does in a female? What's that? Yeah, libido, but also aggression, possessiveness, dominant behavior. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, a, in a male, they actually drop. And that's why dudes are all of a sudden like, <laughs> I mean, that at least contributes to that idea. Now, I hope I showed you a couple things here. 
first of all, that clicking, clicking, clicking is just opening up the screen. We do not subscribe to this. We could have put anything in that Facebook page. As a matter of fact, one of the most popular experiments we did um, back when I had a job was <laughs> clicking a bad page or clicking a completely random to a bad page. Um, most adults um, know this when they, when they type Sheila. Um, but if you have a bad experience with Sheila, this is actually real. If you have a bad experience with Sheila, you're likely to think Sheila is like a great lady. We used to pair that feeling, a bad feeling, with great Kool Aid. So anytime they had great Kool Aid, we threw them with something that would make them sick. And then guess what? After that, they stayed with Kool Aid. Behavior of real some reason, the I like thing stays greater than um, the same reaction happening, causing another reaction, causing another reaction. Um, because I don't think I want to be judged. I don't think I want you to know what's really clicking and what I'm going to do. I don't want you to be able to medicate my life. <laughs> right? Um, but those series of chemical reactions are so complex. There's so many different Maybe that is God. Uh, but in the end, um, right? So it, it has to be because it was actually the experiment I stole. Uh, I actually stole this one, so I like that too. Um, but can you imagine that? Like, oh, honey, you're going to Vegas? <laughs> what? Um, or like texting your, your spouse and, oh, you're not going. So what you do with this? So do we actually start to therapeutically treat these qualities? If we figure this system out, it would make sense that we should talk to Sheila. Is that something we should do? Should they be a selective quality? I hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a great day. Um, watch those uh, obsessive behaviors. <laughs> Don't do drugs or heroin. <laughs>
They're less developed in many areas, but as far as the is concerned, it turns out that we have almost the same exact name. Uh, okay. Because the thing is, you think about it, it's based on the If your first hunger is your first one of your first addictions, if you try to go without food, it looks great. If you eat too much, you're going to die. And if you eat too much of it consistently, you'll actually develop a resistance to that feeling, and you'll eat more and more. 